Andrea del Sarto by Robert Browning Read for LibriVox.org by Algy Pug Perth, Western Australia But do not let us quarrel any more No, my Lucrezia, bear with me for once Sit down, and all shall happen as you wish You turn your face, but does it bring your heart I'll work then for your friend's friend, and never fear Treat his own subject after his own way Fix his own time, except to his own price, and shut the money into this small hand, when next it takes mine. Will it? Tenderly? Oh, I'll content him, but to-morrow, love, I often am much wearier than you think, this evening more than usual, and it seems as if, forgive me, but should you let me sit here by the window with your hand in mine, and look half hour forth on Fiesole, both of one mind, as married people use, quietly, quietly the evening through, I might get up to-morrow to my work cheerful and fresh as ever. Let us try. To-morrow, how you shall be glad for this, your soft hand is a woman of itself, and mine the man's bared breast she curls inside. Don't count the time lost, neither. You must serve for each of the five pictures we require. It saves a model. So, keep looking so. My serpentining beauty rounds on rounds. How could you ever prick those perfect ears, even to put the pearl there? Oh, so sweet! My face, my moon, my everybody's moon, which everybody looks on and calls his, and, I suppose, is looked on by, in turn, while she looks. No one's. Very dear, no less. You smile. Why, there's my picture ready made. There's what we painters call our harmony. A common grain of silver's everything, all in the twilight, you and I alike, you at the point of your first pride in me. That's gone, you know. But I, at every point, my youth, my hope, my art, all being toned down to yonder sober, pleasant, fiesole. There's the bell clinking from the chapel top. That length of convent wall across the way holds the trees safer, huddled more inside. The last monk leaves the garden. Days decrease, and autumn grows, autumn in everything. Eh? The whole seems to fall into a shape, as if I saw alike my work and self, and all that I was born to be and do, a twilight piece. Love, we are in God's hand. How strange now looks the life he makes us lead. So free we seem, so fettered fast, we are. I feel he laid the fetter. Let it lie. This chamber, for example, turn your head. All that's behind us. You don't understand, nor care to understand about my art, but you can hear at least when people speak. And that cartoon, the second from the door, it is the thing, love, so such thing should be. Behold, Madonna, I am bold to say I can do with my pencil what I know, what I see, what at bottom of my heart I wish for, if I ever wish so deep. Do easily, too, when I say, perfectly. I do not boast, perhaps. You are judge, who listened to the legate's talk last week, and just as much they used to say in France, at any rate tis easy, all of it. No sketches first, no studies, that's long past. I do what many dream of all their lives. Dream, strive to do, and agonize to do, and fail in doing. I could count twenty such on twice your fingers, and not leave this town, who strive. You don't know how the others strive to paint a little thing like that you smeared, carelessly passing with your robes afloat, yet do much less, 
so much less. Someone says, I know his name, no matter, so much less. Well, less is more, Lucrezia. I am judged. There burns a truer light of God in them, in their vexed, beating, stuffed and stopped up brain, heart, or whate'er else, and goes on to prompt this low-pulsed forthright craftsman's hand of mine. Their works drop groundward, but themselves, I know, reach many a time a heaven that's shut to me. Enter, and take their place there sure enough, though they come back and cannot tell the world. My works are nearer heaven, but I sit here. The sudden blood of these men, at a word praise them, it boils, or blame them, it boils too. I, painting for myself and to myself, know what I do, am unmoved by men's blame, or their praise either. Somebody remarks, Morello's outline there is wrongly traced, his hue mistaken. What of that? Or else, rightly traced and well ordered? What of that? Speak as they please, what does the mountain care? Ah, but a man's reach should exceed his grasp, or what's a heaven for? All is silver-grey, placid and perfect with my art, the worse. I know both what I want and what might gain, and yet how profitless to know, to sigh. Had I been too another and myself, our head would have o'erlooked the world. No doubt yonder's a work now, of that famous youth, the urbanite who died five years ago. Tis copied, George Vasari sent it me. Well, I can fancy how he did it all, pouring his soul with kings and popes to see, reaching that heaven might so replenish him, above and through his art, for it gives way. That arm is wrongly put, and there again, a fault to pardon in the drawing's lines, its body, so to speak, its soul is right. He means right, that a child may understand. Still, what an arm! And I could alter it. But all the play, the insight, and the stretch, out of me, out of me, and wherefore out? Have you enjoined them on me, given me soul? We might have risen to Raphael, I and you. Nay, love, you do give all I asked, I think, more than I merit, yes, many times, but had you, oh, with the same perfect brow and perfect eyes, and more than perfect mouth, and the low voice my soul hears, as a bird the fowler's pipe, and follows to the snare, had you, with these the same, but brought a mind. Some women do so, had the mouth there urged, God and the glory, never care for gain, the present by the future, what is that? Live for fame, side by side with Agnolo. Raphael is waiting, up to God, all three. I might have done it for you, so it seems. Perhaps not. All is as God overrules. Beside, incentives come from the soul's self, the rest avail not. Why do I need you? What wife had Raphael, or has Agnolo? In this world who can do a thing will not, and who would do it cannot, I perceive. Yet the will's somewhat, somewhat to the power, and thus we half-men struggle. At the end, God, I conclude, compensates, punishes. Tis safer for me, if the award be strict, that I am something underrated here, poor this long while, despised to speak the truth. I dared not, do you know, leave home all day, for fear of chancing on the Paris lords. The best is when they pass and look aside, but they speak sometimes. I must bear it all. Well may they speak, that Francis, that first time, and that long festal year at Fontainebleau, I surely then could sometimes leave the ground, put on the glory, Raphael's daily wear, 
in that humane great monarch's golden look, one finger in his beard or twisted curl over his mouth's good mark that made the smile, one arm about my shoulder, round my neck, the jingle of his gold chain in my ear, I painting proudly with his breath on me, all his court round him, seeing with his eyes, such frank French eyes, and such a fire of souls profuse, my hand kept plying by those hearts, and, best of all, this, this, this face beyond, this in the background, waiting on my work, to crown the issue with a last reward. A good time, was it not, my kingly days? And had you not grown restless? But I know, tis done and past. T'was right, my instinct said, too live the life grew, golden and not grey. And I'm the weak-eyed bat no son should tempt out of the grange whose four walls make his world. How could it end in any other way? You called me, and I came home to your heart. The triumph was, to reach and stay there. Since I reached it ere the triumph, what is lost? Let your hands frame your face in your hair's gold, you beautiful Lucrezia that are mine. Raphael did this, Andrea painted that. The Romans is the better when you pray, but still the other's virgin was his wife. Men will excuse me. I am glad to judge both pictures in your presence. Clearer grows my better fortune. I resolve to think. For, do you know, Lucrezia, as God lives, said one day Agnolo, his very self, to Raphael, I have known it all these years, when the young man was flaming out his thoughts upon a palace wall for Rome to see, too lifted up in heart because of it. Friend, there's a certain sorry little scrub goes up and down our Florence, none cares how, who were he set to plan and execute, as you are, pricked on by your popes and kings, would bring the sweat into that brow of yours, to Raphael's. And indeed the arm is wrong. I hardly dare, yet only you to see. Give the chalk here, quick, thus the line should go. Ay, but the soul, he's Raphael. Rub it out. Still, all I care for, if he spoke the truth, what he, why, who but Michel Agnolo? Do you forget already words like those? If really there was such a chance so lost, is, whether you're not grateful, but more pleased. Well, let me think so. And you smile indeed. This hour has been an hour. Another smile? If you would sit thus by me every night, I should work better. Do you comprehend? I mean that I should earn more, give you more. See, it is settled dusk now. There's a star. Morello's gone. The watchlights show the wall. The cue owls speak the name we call them by. Come from the window, love. Come in, at last, inside the melancholy little house we built to be so gay with. God is just. King Francis may forgive me. Oft at nights, when I look up from painting, eyes tired out, the walls become illumined, brick from brick, distinct, instead of mortar, fierce, bright gold, that gold of his I did cement them with. Let us but love each other. Must you go? That cousin here again? He waits outside. Must see you, you, and not with me? Those loans? More gaming debts to pay? You smiled for that? Well, let smiles buy me. Have you more to spend? While hand and eye, and something of a heart are left me, Works my wear, and what's it worth? I'll pay my fancy, only let me sit the grey remainder of the evening out. Idle, you call it, and muse perfectly, How I could paint were I but back in France. One picture, just one more, the virgin's face, not yours this time. I want you at my side to hear them, that is, 
Michel Agnolo. Judge all I do and tell you of its worth. Will you? Tomorrow, satisfy your friend. I will take the subject for his corridor, finish the portrait out of hand. There, there and throw him in another thing or two if he demurs. The whole should prove enough to pay for this same cousin's freak. Beside, what's better, and what's all I care about? Get you the thirteen scudi for the rough. Love, does that please you? Ah, but what does he, the cousin, what does he to please you more? I am grown peaceful as old age to-night. I regret little. I would change still less. Since there my past life lies, why alter it? The very wrong to Francis, it is true, I took his coin, was tempted and complied, and built this house, and sinned, and all is said. My father and my mother died of want. Well, had I riches of my own? You see how one gets rich. Let each one bear his lot. They were born poor, lived poor, and poor they died, and I have laboured somewhat in my time, and have not been paid profusely. Some good son paint my two hundred pictures, let him try. No doubt the something strikes a balance. Yes, you love me quite enough, it seems, to-night. This must suffice me here. What would one have? In heaven, perhaps, new chances, one more chance. Four great walls in the new Jerusalem, meted on each side by the angels' reed, Raphael, Agnolo, and me to cover, the first three without a wife, while I have mine. So still they overcome, because there's still Lucrezia, as I choose. Again the cousins whistle, go, my love. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Corinne's Last Love Song by Jane Francesca Lady Wilde Read for LibriVox.org by Victoria Grace How beautiful, how beautiful you streamed upon my sight In glory and in grandeur as a gorgeous sunset light How softly soul-subduing fill your words upon mine ear, like low aerial music when some angel hovers near. What tremulous faint ecstasy to clasp your hand in mine, till the darkness fell upon me of a glory too divine. The air around grew languid with our intermingled breath, and in your beauty's shadow I sank motionless as death. I saw you not, I heard not, for a mist was on my brain. I only felt that life could give no joy like that again. And this was love, I knew it not, but blindly floated on. And now I'm on the ocean waste, dark, desolate, alone. The waves are raging round me, I'm reckless where they guide. No hope is left to right me, no strength to stem the tide, as a leaf along the torrent, a cloud across the sky, as dust upon the whirlwind, so my life is drifting by. The dream that drank the meteor's light, the form from heaven has flown, the vision and the glory, they are passing, they are gone. Oh, love is frantic agony, and life one throb of pain. Yet I would bear its darkest woes to dream that dream again. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Digging by Edward Thomas. Read for LibriVox.org by Patrick Wallace. Today I think only with sense. Scents dead leaves yield, and bracken, and wild carrot seed, and the square mustard field. Odours that rise when the spade wounds the root of tree, rose, currant, raspberry or goutweed, rhubarb or celery. 
the smoke smell too, flowing from where a bonfire burns the dead, the waste, the dangerous, and all to sweetness turns. It is enough to smell, to crumble the dark earth, while the robin sings over again sad songs of autumn mirth. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Grammarian's Funeral, Shortly After the Revival of Learning by Robert Browning Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug Perth, Western Australia Let us begin and carry up this corpse singing together. Leave we the common crofts, the vulgar thorps, each in its tether, sleeping safe on the bosom of the plain, cared for till cock crow. Look out, if yonder be not day again, rimming the rock row. That's the appropriate country. There, man's thought, rarer, intenser, self-gathered for an outbreak, as it ought, chiefs in the censer. Leave we the unlettered plain, its herd and crop. Seek we sepulture, on a tall mountain, cityed to the top, crowded with culture. All the peaks saw, but one the rest excels, clouds overcome it? No, yonder sparkle is the citadel's circling its summit, thither our path lies, wind we up the heights? Wait ye the warning? Our low life was the levels and the nights, he's for the morning. Step to a tune, square chests, erect each head, where the beholders, this is our master, famous, calm, and dead, born on our shoulders. Sleep, crop and herd, sleep, darkling thorpe and croft, safe from the weather. He whom we convoy to his grave aloft, singing together, he was a man born with thy face and throat, lyric Apollo. Long he lived nameless. How should spring take note? Winter would follow, till lo, the little touch, and youth was gone. Cramped and diminished, moaned he, new measures, other feet anon, my dance is finished? No, that's the world's way, keep the mountainside, make for the city. He knew the signal, and stepped on with pride over men's pity, left play for work, and grappled with the world, bent on escaping. What's in the scroll, quoth he, thou keepest furled, show me their shaping, theirs who most studied man, the bard and sage, give. So he gowned him, straight got by heart that book to its last page, learned we found him, yea, but we found him bold too, eyes like lead, accents uncertain, time to taste life, another would have said, up with the curtain. This man said rather, actual life comes next. Patience a moment, grant I have mastered learning's crabbed text. Still there's the comment, let me know all, prate not of most or least, painful or easy. Even to the crumbs I'd fain eat up the feast, I nor feel queasy. Oh, such a life as he resolved to live, when he had learned it, when he had gathered all books had to give. Sooner he spurned it. Imagine the whole, then execute the parts. Fancy the fabric quite, ere you build, ere steel strike fire from quartz, ere mortar dab brick. Here's the town gate reached, there's the market place gaping before us. Yea, this in him was a peculiar grace, hearten our chorus, that before living he'd learn how to live, no end to learning, earn the means first, God surely will contrive use for our earning. Others mistrust and say, but time escapes, live now or never. He said, what's time? Leave now for dogs and apes, man has for ever. Back to his book then, deeper drooped his head, calculus racked him, leaden before, his eyes grew dross of lead. Tussus attacked him. Now, master, take a little rest. Not he. Caution redoubled. Step to a breast. The way winds narrowly. Not a whit troubled. Back to his studies, fresher than at first. 
Fierce as the dragon, he, soul high tropic with a sacred thirst, sucked at the flagon. Oh, if we draw a circle premature, heedless of far gain, greedy for quick returns of profit, sure bad is our bargain. Was it not great? Did he not throw on God? He loves the burden. God's task to make the heavenly period perfect the earthen? Did he not magnify the mind, show clear just what it all meant? He would not discount life, as fools do here, paid by instalment. He ventured neck or nothing, heaven's success found, or earth's failure. Wilt thou trust death or not? He answered, yes, hence with life's pale lure. That low man seeks a little thing to do, sees it and does it. This high man, with a great thing to pursue, dies ere he knows it. That low man goes on adding one to one, his hundreds soon hit. This high man, aiming at a million, misses a unit. That has the world here, should he need the next, let the world mind him. This throws himself on God, and unperplexed seeking shall find him. So with the throttling hands of death at strife, ground he at grammar, till through the rattle parts of speech were rife, while he could stammer, he settled Hooti's business. Let it be, properly based Uin, gave us the doctrine of the enclitic D, dead from the waist down. Well, here's the platform, here's the proper place. Hail to your Perlius, all ye high flies with a feathered race, swallows and curlews. Here's the top peak, the multitude below live, for they can there. This man decided not to live, but no. Bury this man there? Here, here's his place, where meteors shoot, clouds form, lightnings are loosened. Stars come and go, let joy break with the storm, peace let the dew send. Lofty designs must close in like effects, loftily lying, leave him, still loftier than the world suspects, living and dying. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. If thou must love me, let it be for naught. By Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Recording by Carol Box. If thou must love me, let it be for naught except for love's sake only. Do not say, I love her for her smile, her look, her way of speaking gently for a trick of thought that falls in well with mine, and Zertes brought a sense of pleasant ease on such a day. For these things in themselves, beloved, may be changed or changed for thee, and love so wrought may be unwrought so, neither love me for thine own dear pity's wiping my cheeks dry. A creature might forget to weep who bore thy comfort long, and lose thy love thereby. But love me for love's sake, that evermore thou mayest love on through love's eternity. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. I Want to Die While You Love Me by Georgia Douglas Johnson Read for LibriVox.org by Isha Mitchell in Denver, Colorado I want to die while you love me, while yet you hold me fair, while laughter lies upon my lips and lights are in my hair. I want to die while you love me, and bear to that still bed, your kisses turbulent, unspent, to warm me when I'm dead. I want to die while you love me, oh, who would care to live, till love has nothing more to ask and nothing more to give. I want to die while you love me, and never, never see the glory of this perfect day grow dim or cease to be. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Lake Isle by Ezra Pound Read for LibriVox.org by Lubet O God, O Venus, O Mercury, patron of thieves, Give me in due time, I beseech you, A little tobacco shop, With the little bright boxes Piled up neatly upon the shelves, And the loose, fragrant cavendish, And the shag, and the bright Virginia, loose under the bright glass cases, 
and a pair of scales not too greasy, and the whores dropping in for a word or two in passing, for a flip word and to tidy their hair a bit. O God, O Venus, O Mercury, patron of thieves, lend me a little tobacco shop, or install me in any profession save this damned profession of writing where one needs one's brains all the time. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lost Illusions by Georgia Douglas Johnson Read for LibriVox.org by Isha Mitchell in Denver, Colorado Oh, for the veils of my faraway youth, shielding my heart from the blaze of the truth, why did I stray from their shelter and grow into the sadness that follows to know? Impotent atom with desolate gaze, threading the tumult of hazardous ways. Oh, for the veils, for the veils of my youth, veils that hung low o'er the blaze of the truth. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Mad Gardener's Song by Lewis Carroll Read for LibriVox.org by Tony Scheinman Forest Hills, New York Website www.tscheinman.mysite.com The Mad Gardener's Song by Lewis Carroll He thought he saw an elephant that practiced on a fife. He looked again and found it was a letter from his wife. At length I realize, he said, the bitterness of life. He thought he saw a buffalo upon the chimney-piece. He looked again, and found it was his sister's husband's niece. Unless you leave this house, he said, I'll send for the police. He thought he saw a rattlesnake that questioned him in Greek. He looked again, and found it was the middle of next week. The one thing I regret he said, is that it cannot speak. He thought he saw a banker's clerk descending from the bus. He looked again, and found it was a hippopotamus. If this should stay to dine, he said, there won't be much for us. He thought he saw a kangaroo that worked a coffee mill. He looked again, and found it was a vegetable pill. Were I to swallow this, he said, I should be very ill. He thought he saw a coach and four that stood beside his bed. He looked again, and found it was a bear without a head. Poor thing, he said, poor silly thing, it's waiting to be fed. He thought he saw an albatross that fluttered round the lamp. He looked again, and found it was a penny postage stamp. You'd best be getting home, he said, the nights are very damp. He thought he saw a garden door that opened with a key. He looked again, and found it was a double rule of three. And all its mystery, he said, is as clear as day to me. He thought he saw an argument that proved he was the Pope. He looked again, and found it was a bar of mottled soap. A fact so dread, he faintly said, extinguishes all hope. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Maid's Lament by Walter Savage Lander Read for LibriVox.org by Florence Short I loved him not, and yet now he is gone, I feel I am alone. I checked him while he spoke, yet could he speak, Alas, I would not check. For reasons not to love him once I sought, And wearied all my thought to vex myself and him. I now would give my love, could he but live, Who lately lived for me. And when he found was vain, in holy ground He hid his face amid the shades of death. I waste for him my breath, who wasted his for me, but mine returns, 
and this lorn bosom burns with stifling heat, heaving it up in sleep, and waking me to weep tears that had melted his soft heart. For years wept he as bitter tears. Merciful God, such was his latest prayer, these may she never share. Quieter is his breath, his breath's more cold than daisies in the mold, where children spell athwart the churchyard gate, his name and life's brief date. Pray for him, gentle souls, whoe'er you be, and oh, pray too for me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mariana by Alfred Lord Tennyson Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Giessen In Hazelmere, Surrey With blackest moss the flower-plots Were thickly crusted one and all. The rusted nails fell from the knot that held the pear to the gable wall the broken sheds looked sad and strange unlifted was the clinking latch weeded and worn the ancient thatch upon the lonely moated grange she only said my life is dreary he cometh not she said she said, I am a-weary, a-weary, I would that I were dead. Her tears fell with the dews at even, her tears fell ere the dews were dried. She could not look on the sweet heaven, either at morn or eventide. After the flitting of the bats, when thickest dark did trance the sky, she drew her casement curtain by, and glanced athwart the glooming flats. She only said, My life is dreary, he cometh not, she said. She said, I am a-weary, a-weary, I would that I were dead. Upon the middle of the night, waking, she heard the night-fowl crow, the cock sung out an hour ere light from the dark fen the oxen's low came to her without hope of change in sleep she seemed to walk forlorn till cold winds woke the grey-eyed morn about the lonely moated grange she only said the day is dreary he cometh not, she said. She said, I am a-weary, a-weary, I would that I were dead. About a stone cast from the wall, a sluice with blackened waters slept, and o'er it many round and small, the clustered marish mosses crept. Hard by, a poplar shook all way, All silver-green with gnarled bark, For leagues no other tree did mark The level waste, the rounding grey. She only said, My life is dreary, He cometh not, she said. She said, I am a-weary, a-weary, I would that I were dead. And ever when the moon was low, And the shrill winds were up and away In the white curtain, to and fro, She saw the gusty shadow sway. But when the moon was very low, And wild winds bound within their cell, The shadow of the poplar fell upon her bed, Across her brow. She only said, The night is dreary, He cometh not, she said. She said, I am a-weary, a-weary, 
i would that i were dead all day within the dreamy house the doors upon their hinges creaked the blue fly sung in the pane the mouse behind the mouldering wainscot shrieked or from the crevice peered about old faces glimmered through the doors old footsteps trod the upper floors old voices called her from without she only said my life is dreary he cometh not she said she said i am a-weary a-weary i would that i were dead the sparrows chirrup on the roof the slow clock ticking and the sound which to the wooing wind aloof the poplar made did all confound her sense but most she loathed the hour when the thick-moted sunbeam lay athwart the chambers and the day was sloping toward his western bower then said she i am very dreary he will not come she said she wept i am a weary a weary o oh god that i were dead end of poem this recording is in the public domain melancholetta by lewis carroll read for LibriVox.org by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey with saddest music all day long she soothed her secret sorrow at night she sighed i fear twas wrong such cheerful words to borrow dearest a sweeter sadder song i'll sing to thee to-morrow i thanked her but i could not say that i was glad to hear it i left the house at break of day and did not venture near it till time i hoped had worn away her grief for naught could cheer it my dismal sister couldst thou know the wretched home thou keepest thy brother drowned in daily woe is thankful when thou sleepest for if i laugh however low when thou art awake thou weepest hmm. i took my sister t'other day excuse the slang expression to saddler's wells to see the play in hopes the new impression might in her thoughts from grave to gay effect some slight digression i asked three gay young dogs from town to join us in our folly whose mirth i thought might serve to drown my sister's melancholy the lively jones the sportive brown and robinson the jolly the maid announced the meal in tones that i myself had taught her meant to allay my sister's moans like oil on troubled water i rushed to jones the lively jones and begged him to escort her vainly he strove with ready wit to joke about the weather to ventilate the last on deed to quote the price of leather she groaned here i and sorrow sit let us lament together i urged you're wasting time you know delay will spoil the venison my heart is wasted with my woe there is no rest in venice on the bridge of sighs she quoted low from byron and from tennyson 
i need not tell of soup and fish in solemn silence swallowed the sobs that ushered in each dish and its departure followed nor yet my suicidal wish to be the cheese i hollowed some desperate attempts were made to start a conversation madam the sportive brown essayed which kind of recreation hunting or fishing have you made your special occupation her lips curved downwards instantly as if of india rubber hounds in full cry i like said she oh how i longed to snub her of fish a whale's the one for me it is so full of blubber the night's performance was king john it's dull she wept and so so a while i let her tears flow on she said they soothed her woe so at length the curtain rose upon bombastes furioso in vain we roared in vain we tried to rouse her into laughter her pensive glances wandered wide from orchestra to rafter tear upon tear she said and sighed and silence followed after end of poem this recording is in the public domain november by walter de la mer read for LibriVox.org by Erin. there is wind where the rose was cold rain where sweet grass was and clouds like sheep stream over the steep gray skies where the lark was not warm where your hand was not gold where your hair was but phantom forlorn beneath the thorn your ghost where your face was cold wind where your voice was tears tears where my heart was and ever with me child ever with me silence where hope was end of poem this recording is in the public domain Oh, what their joy and their glory must be by peter abelard read for LibriVox.org by sharon chimradan of www.sharonmedia.net on the third of september two thousand and eleven oh what their joy and their glory must be those endless sabbaths the blessed ones see crowns for the valiant for weary ones rest, God shall be all, and in all ever blessed. Truly, Jerusalem, name we that shore, vision of peace that brings hope evermore. Wish and fulfillment shall severed be ne'er, nor the thing prayed for come short of the prayer. There, where no trouble distraction can bring, we the sweet anthems of Zion shall sing. While for thy grace, Lord, their voices of praise, thy blessed people eternally raise. Now, in the meantime, with hearts raised on high, we for that country must yearn and must sigh, seeking Jerusalem, dear native land, through the long exile on Babylon's strand. Lo, before him with our praises we fall, of whom and in whom and through whom are all, of whom the Father and in whom the Son, through whom the Spirit, with both ever one. End of poem. This recording 
is in the public domain. Ozymandias by Percy Bysshe Shelley Read for LibriVox.org by Dirk Vanderwilt I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear, My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare the lone and level sands stretch far away. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Phyllis's Age by Matthew Pryor Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Silva How old may Phyllis be, you ask, Whose beauty thus all hearts engages? To answer is no easy task, For she has really two ages. Stiff in brocard and pinched in stays, Her patches, paint, and jewels on, All day let envy view her face, and Phyllis is but twenty-one. Paint, patches, jewels laid aside. At night astronomers agree. The evening has the day belied, and Phyllis is some forty-three. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Pubble Who Has No Toes by Edward Lear Read for LibriVox.org by Tony Scheinman, Forest Hills, New York, website www.tscheinman.mysite.com The Pubble Who Has No Toes by Edward Lear The Pubble Who Has No Toes had once as many as we. When they said, Some day you may lose them all, he replied, Fish, fiddle-dee-dee. And his aunt Jabiska made him drink lavender water, tinged with pink, for she said, The world in general knows there's nothing so good for a pobble's toes. The pobble who has no toes swam across the Bristol Channel, but before he set out he wrapped his nose in a piece of scarlet flannel, for his aunt Jabiska said, No harm can come to his toes if his nose is warm and it's perfectly known that a pobble's toes are safe provided he minds his nose the pobble swam fast and well and when boats or ships came near him he tinkledy binkledy winkled a bell so that all the world could hear him and all the sailors and admirals cried when they saw him nearing the further side he has gone to fish for his aunt jubiska's runcible cat with crimson whiskers but before he touched the shore the shore of the Bristol Channel, a sea-green porpoise carried away his wrapper of scarlet flannel, and when he came to observe his feet, formerly garnished with toes so neat, his face at once became forlorn, on perceiving that all his toes were gone. And nobody ever knew, from that dark day to the present, whoso had taken the pobble's toes, in a manner so far from pleasant, whether the shrimps or crawfish gray or crafty mermaids stole them away, nobody knew. And nobody knows how the pobble was robbed of his twice five toes. The pobble who has no toes was placed in a friendly bark, and they rowed him back and carried him up to his Aunt Jobiska's park, and she made him a feast at his earnest wish of eggs and buttercups fried with fish. And she said, It's a fact the whole world knows that pobbles are happier without their toes. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Portrait d'une femme by Ezra Pound Read for LibriVox.org by Lubet Your mind and you are our Sargasso Sea. London has swept about you this score years, and bright ships left you this or that in fee. Ideas, old gossip, oddments of all things, strange spars of knowledge and dimmed wares of price. Great minds have sought you, lacking someone else. You have been second, always. Tragical? No. You preferred it to the usual thing. One dull man, dulling and uxorious. One average mind with one thought less each year. Oh, you are patient. I have seen you sit hours where something might have floated up. And now you pay one. Yes, you richly pay. You are a person of some interest. One comes to you and takes strange gain away. Trophies fished up, some curious suggestion, fact that leads nowhere, and a tale or two pregnant with mandrakes or with something else that might prove useful and yet never proves that never fits a corner or shows use, or finds its hour upon the loom of days. The tarnished, gaudy, wonderful old work, idols and ambergris and rare inlays, these are your riches and your great store. And yet, for all this sea hoard of deciduous things, strange woods half sodden and new brighter stuff, in the slow float of differing light and deep. No, there is nothing. In the whole and all, nothing that's quite your own. Yet this is you. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Study in Gray by Ambrose Bierce Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp I step from the door with a shiver. This fog is uncommonly cold. And I ask myself, what did I give her? The maiden, a trifle gone old, with a head of gray hair that was gold. Oh, well, I suppose twas a dollar, and doubtless the change is correct, though it's odd that it seems so much smaller than what I'd a right to expect. What do you pay when you dine, I reflect. So I walk up the street. T'was a saunter a score of years back when I strolled from this door, and our talk was all banter those days when her hair was of gold and the sea fog less searching and cold. I button my coat, for I'm shaken and fevered a trifle and flushed with the wine that I ought to have taken. Time was at this coat I'd have blushed though truly it's cleverly brushed. A score? Why, that isn't so very much time to have lost from a life. There's reason enough to be merry. I've not fallen down in the strife, but marched with the drum and the fife. If hope, when she lured me and beckoned, had pushed at my shoulders instead, and fame, on whose favors I reckoned, had laureled the worthiest head, I could garland the years that are dead. Believe me, I've held my own, mostly, through all of this wild masquerade, but somehow the fog is more ghostly tonight, and the skies are more grayed, like the locks of the restaurant maid. If ever I'd fainted and faltered, I'd fancy this did but appear, but the climate I'm certain has altered, grown colder and more austere than it was in that earlier year. The lights, too, are strangely unsteady that lead from the street to the quay. I think they'll go out, and I'm ready to follow. Out there in the sea, the fog bell is calling to me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Surprised by Joy Impatient as the Wind by William Wordsworth Read for LibriVox.org by Elizabeth Clett
surprised by joy, impatient as the wind, I turned to share the transport. Oh, with whom but thee, deep buried in the silent tomb, that spot which no vicissitude can find. Love, faithful love, recalled thee to my mind. But how could I forget thee? Through what power, even for the least division of an hour, have I been so beguiled as to be blind to my most grievous loss? That thought's return was the worst pang that sorrow ever bore. Save one, one only, when I stood forlorn, knowing my heart's best treasure was no more, that neither present time nor years unborn could to my sight that heavenly face restore. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Twins by Henry Sambrook Lee Read by Pamela Krantz September 18, 2011 In form and feature, face and limb, I grew so like my brother that folks got taking me for him, and each for one another. It puzzled all our kith and kin. It reached a fearful pitch, for one of us was born a twin, yet not a soul knew which. One day, to make the matter worse, before our names were fixed, as we were being washed by nurse, we got completely mixed. And thus, you see, by fate's decree, or rather nurse's whim, my brother John got christened me, and I got christened him. This fatal likeness even dogged my footsteps when at school, and I was always getting flogged, for John turned out a fool. I put this question fruitlessly to everyone I knew. What would you do if you were me, to prove that you were you? Our close resemblance turned the tide of my domestic life, for somehow my intended bride became my brother's wife. In fact, year after year the same absurd mistakes went on, and when I died the neighbors came and buried Brother John. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ulysses by Alfred Lord Tennyson Read for LibriVox.org by Elizabeth Clett It little profits that an idle king, by this still hearth, among these barren crags, Matched with an aged wife, I meet and dole unequal laws unto a savage race, That hoard and sleep and feed, and know not me. I cannot rest from travel, I will drink life to the lees. All times I have enjoyed greatly, have suffered greatly, Both with those that loved me, and alone, on shore, and when through scudding drifts the rainy Hyades vexed the dim sea. I am become a name. For always roaming with a hungry heart, much have I seen and known, cities of men, and manners, climates, councils, governments, myself not least, but honoured of them all and drunk delight of battle with my peers, far on the ringing plains of windy Troy. I am a part of all that I have met, yet all experience is an arch wherethrough gleams that untravelled world, whose margin fades for ever and for ever when I move. How dull it is to pause, to make an end, to rust unburnished, not to shine in use, as though to breathe were life. Life piled on life were all too little, and of one to me little remains. But every hour is saved from that eternal silence, something more, a bringer of new things, 
and vile it were for some three sons to store and hoard myself, and this grey spirit yearning in desire to follow knowledge like a sinking star beyond the utmost bound of human thought. This is my son, mine own Telemachus, to whom I leave the sceptre and the isle, well loved of me, discerning to fulfil this labour, by slow prudence to make mild a rugged people, and through soft degrees subdue them to the useful and the good. Most blameless is he, centred in the sphere of common duties, decent not to fail in offices of tenderness, and pay meet adoration to my household gods when I am gone. He works his work, I mine. There lies the port, the vessel puffs her sail, there gloom the dark broad seas. My mariners, souls that have toiled and wrought and thought with me, that ever with a frolic welcome took the thunder and the sunshine, and opposed free hearts, free foreheads. You and I are old. Old age hath yet his honour and his toil. Death closes all, but something ere the end, some work of noble note may yet be done, not unbecoming men that strove with gods. The lights begin to twinkle from the rocks, the long day wanes, the slow moon climbs, the deep moans round with many voices. Come, my friends, tis not too late to seek a newer world. Push off, and sitting well in order, smite the sounding furrows, for my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset, and the baths of all the western stars, until I die. It may be that the gulfs will wash us down, it may be that we shall touch the happy isles, and see the great Achilles whom we knew. Though much is taken, much abides and though we are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are, one equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will, to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. Voices by Walter de la Mer Read for LibriVox.org by Eileen Who is it calling by the darkened river Where the moss lies smooth and deep And the dark trees lean unmoving arms Silent and vague in sleep and the bright-heeled constellations pass in splendor through the gloom. Who is it calling over the darkened river, in music, come? Who is it wandering in the summer meadows, where the children stoop and play, in the green faint-scented flowers, spinning the guileless hours away? Who touches their bright hair, who puts a windshell to each cheek, whispering betwixt its breathing silences, Seek, seek. Who is it watching in the gathering twilight when the curfew bird hath flown, on eager wings from song to silence to its darkened nest alone? Who takes for brightening eyes the stars, for locks the still moonbeam, sighs through the dews of evening peacefully falling, dream, End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Those Wedding Bells Shall Not Ring Out by Monroe H. Rosenfeld Read for LibriVox.org by Delmar H. Dolbeer A sexton stood one Sabbath eve within a belfry grand, awaiting signal from the church with bell-rope in his hand as in the house of worship stood a young and happy pair to pledge their troth for evermore each other's love to share the holy man then spake these words 
before your join for life, has any person ought to say against you as man and wife. Then down the aisle there came a man with quick and eager tread, and pointing to the trembling bride, these words he calmly said, Those wedding bells must not ring out. She is another's bride. I saw her at the altar rail. We stood there side by side. She cannot claim another's hand. She dare not break the law's command. A guilty wife you see her stand. Those bells shall not ring out. The minister was speechless, and the bridegroom stood amazed. The congregation spellbound sat and thought the man was crazed. The bride had not a word to say, but simply hung her head. Who is this man? the preacher asked. I know him not, she said. Then ring the bells, the bridegroom cried. The man knelt to entreat. The sexton swung the chimes aloft. The bells rang clear and sweet. But scarce their music had begun, when forth there came a shout. Stand back, I say, they shall not ring. Those bells shall not ring out. Those wedding bells shall not ring out. I swear it on my life. For we were wedded years ago, and she is still my wife. She shall not break her vows to me. She's mine through all eternity. She's mine till death shall set her free. Those bells shall not ring out. A shriek of woe, a glittering blade, a lurch, a flash, a dart, and like the lightning stroke the blade had reached her trembling heart. You've killed his bride, oh God, they cried. He swung the gleaming blade, and pierced his own heart as he gasped, Nay, not his bride, my wife. Two forms lay cold within the aisle, the husband and the bride, as once in life he claimed they stood in wedlock side by side. His vow was kept, the bells had ceased, and with his dying breath, these words once more he murmured, ere his lips were closed in death. Those wedding bells shall not ring out, I swear it on my life, for we were wedded years ago, and she is still my wife. She shall not break her vows to me. She's mine through all eternity. She's mine till death shall set her free. Those bells shall not ring out. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Willow Trees by Augusta Baldwin. Read for LibriVox.org by Sharon Chimrudan of www.sharonmedia.net on the 3rd of September, 2011. Sweet trees. How oft in early years I've sat beneath your quiet shade, Ere life was clouded o'er with tears, Or one sweet flower had leaned to fade. Their infant sports and childhood's glee Were heard through many a summer day, Then every heart from grief was free, And life was robed in hues of May. Their first the Sabbath morning gave its lesson from the sacred word. And as we viewed your branches wave, we learned the love of Christ the Lord. There, when the early morning rose, our father sought his own loved seat, and after dewy evening's close, he trod that undisturbed retreat. Then converse lit the passing hour, with joy no other time hath worn, what sweeter than the springtime flower, or lovelier than the light of morn? When rustling in the trembling breeze, a whispering melody you sung, I learned from you, sweet willow trees, the music that through nature rung. Still, still you sing, and still you wave, your boughs as in those days of yore, but some are gone, O oh, stranger save, one for my grave, I ask no more. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.